The views and opinions expressed in the following podcast do not necessarily reflect those of the producers, the affiliates, or digital platforms hosting this podcast. All content is for the purposes of education, conjecture, and at times entertainment. We promote inclusiveness and diversity. Enjoy the show. Welcome to Into the Deep with Jay Casta. Welcome to Into the Deep. I'm Jay Costa. Healing with sound is believed to date back to ancient cultures when music was used in an attempt to cure people. Throughout history, music itself has been used to boost the morale of people, help them work faster or more productively, or in some instances, even ward off evil spirits by chanting. What is it about sound? And can sound heal us internally as well as have an effect on the external world? I'm so excited for today's guest. It's Ian Morris. Ian Morris has developed Listening to Smile. It's a unique sound, wellness, and healing modality. Ian is a multi-instrumentalist, poet, intuitive healer, and he's been working in the creative arts field for over 20 years. He's developed an intuition-based creative and musical synergy that are the building blocks for the development of what he has at Listening to Smile. Today, I talked to Ian we talk about everything, the power of music. We talk about our love of the Deftones and Frank Zappa. We talk about Ian's use of sound healing to shift his personal mindset and how he even overcame cancer, dyslexia, and he's lost well over 150 pounds. We talk about low amplitude, subtle binaural beats for those audiophiles out there and the importance of mindset in healing and navigating through life. So join me as we seek light and journey into the deep with Ian. Enjoy. Welcome to Into the Deep. Uh, <laughs> this is our our first time finally, uh, you know, getting to have a conversation. But, um, you know, for those of us who are tuning in and listening, uh, can you share with us uh, a little bit of insight about who you are and what it is you do what inspires you? Yeah, man. Uh, So my name is Ian Morris, and I'm the founder of Listening to Smile. And Listening to Smile is a unique sound healing company. Our main focus is music licensing and working with the holistic community, Um, holding space and creating tools that are used um, for meditation, relaxation, pain management, anxiety relief, um, and things of that nature. So it's just really using what we call frequency minded music and creating um, other modalities in support of that breath work, meditation, you know, intention setting, things of that nature, and just really harnessing the power of the mind and body connection and um, really using music as a focus point for that, that uh, co-creation process with spirit, I guess, you know, of healing. Right on. I love that. And so, um, I understand that you're a multi-instrumentalist, uh, a 25 ish instruments. Yeah. 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 (laughs) No big deal. (laughs) That's awesome. Yeah. Yeah. Thanks man. Um, yeah, just everything from, uh, the traditional, uh, instruments, you know, tuning forks, gongs, didgeridoos, you know, uh, singing bowls and all of that to guitar, bass, drums, uh, pipa, the yuchin, the rowan, um, you know, all, all string instruments, you know, I, I love it. And, and woodwind, uh, you know, getting into Native American flutes and all kinds of, Ooh. you know, different things of that nature. But yeah, you really just kind of using those instruments as um, mood setters and, and just the different frequency responses that they're working with for the, the work that we're doing. That's awesome. Uh, so a little bit too, uh, I'm also a musician and, uh, I've been playing music for some time as well. And I've always been, I, I've gravitated to stringed instruments and the flute as well. Mm-hmm. Um, and yet the first time I ever had Reiki, I had a throat blockage and mm-hmm. it's, it's fascinating that I'm drawn to, uh, these frequencies and these vibrations. Um, do you feel you were maybe drawn to these frequencies and vibrations a little bit or that 
there are certain frequencies and vibrations that you're needing more of or less of, you know? Yeah. Yeah. Um, well, I was really fortunate. I grew up with a father, uh, you know, that was, uh, musically inclined and had a huge, um, collection of music, you know, like I, when my dad passed away, I think it was like 2000, over 2000 vinyl records, something like that nature <laughs> that, that were, you know, were left as well as instruments. Um, but, you know, um, and so I just grew up around a large plethora of genres of music and just styles that really affected um, me. I think it just put music in my blood right from the beginning and just melody and, and, um, and I think music back then uh, was recorded very differently, you know, and um, it was just the whole approach for capturing sound was very different than it is today. And it's not that there's not some really nice techniques and technology that we capture, but it's just different in the digital age, you know, it's very, very different. So I think being exposed to that analog and different capture style of audio really affected me growing up, you know, just like, especially when you see it in contrast to today's, uh, you know, music. And um, so just, I think from the beginning, I was really drawn to instruments like the hammer dulcimer, oh, the cello. Sure. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. The cello, the hammer dulcimer. And I really love the pipa. Uh, it's a Chinese instrument. And the, um, the other one is like um, a, a yu chin, or they'll call it like a moon guitar. Um, and those instruments just sound so cool to me. I was just immediately drawn to those instruments. Very, very right cool. Yeah. And so I think that when we're drawn to instruments and frequencies like that, there is a reason beyond what we can understand sometimes, uh, you know, and maybe it's uh, exter external forces or our ancestral guides, or maybe it's past life experiences. I, I can't really speak on what that is, but I just know that there's definitely a deep connection with those instruments for a reason. Right on. The uh, hammer dulcimer, not many, like, to hear you say that, like, you know, uh, are you familiar with Ted Yoder as all, at all? No, I'm not he, familiar. Uh, like a few years ago, it like, it, it kind of went viral. There was a, a video of him doing a Tears for Fears song. On oh, the, yeah, the I remember that. Dude, I, I saw it that. Yeah. amazing. I was just like, what? <laughs> yeah. So, yeah, I yeah. don't know. It's anecdotal, but yeah. Uh, so cool that you're you're into that as well, too, man. Um, yeah. So, yeah, it, it, it's, it's interesting and it's fascinating, too, with just like you said like you know what what causes us to gravitate towards these these frequencies you know and then for you um you know i know that with you know you implementing these sounds and 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 frequencies and vibrations uh i know i had read a little something about that you worked with some hospice organizations as well too um i recently lost my mother in february um so my condolences to you losing your father uh, my mother was in hospice for a very short period of time um and because of uh the pandemic we really weren't able to really spend much time with her um uh. and a few conversations we had on the phone we talked about you know senses really um we talked about sounds we talked about songs and we talked about smells um tell me a little bit more about your involvement with uh with hospice yeah, so I think um, I was reading stories about how Rumi was being read, the poetry was being read to a lot of people in, tra in that transition period for hospice. And I was just thinking, like, what a beautiful thing that would be if I was nearing that time in my life and just the comfort, you know, Havez and Rumi are like huge poets in my world. Like, I love the Sufi poets and just it's... um been such a big part of my life if I was at that point and someone would read me that poetry to kind of transition me out uh you know it would just be such a beautiful thing in, in my eyes and so I was thinking like music is is uh such a powerful experience and I was like I, I wonder what that would look like to be involved in that type of so I just started asking a lot of questions and you know people close to me and and kind of got some connections and made a a connection in South Carolina with uh, the hospice center here. And um, they were totally open to the idea. And so we, um, they had 25 rooms. We put the music in all 25 rooms and then trained staff on helping 
the clients to make selections based on what was going on with them, kind of the focus that they were wanting to have, you know, and to use the frequency music as a um, tool, you know, to help with that, that not only for the people in transition, but also the families that are in that grieving and letting go process of that whole thing. And so um, for me, uh, this last year, we made a transition to work with not only hospice, but veterans groups with um, U.S. veterans, service veterans, uh, battle, combat, the PTSD type uh, situations, as well as um, the Humane Society working with uh, rescue animals. And so these three things are very near to my heart. Like, mm. I think these situations are people that could totally benefit from frequency music and just stress relief and pain relief. Um, and then you see the people in the wellness community and the holistic communities that are um, benefiting from it as well. And it's just, it's so humbling and like such an honor to be a part of that process with all of these different people um, that are in these different journeys or different walks. But um, personally having uh, some of the issues that I've gone through, you can relate to a lot. And then you also see in your own journey, like I went through these things and gained this knowledge and experience, not just for myself, but I'm able to say, Hey, this helped me. And maybe this might help you in this time as well. And, um, it's just, it's really neat to be a part of that process. Mm, I love that. It's, it's so wonderful when we can break it down to our own experiences and implementing, you know, what was once thought as pseudoscience, right? And people not really realizing that, I mean, well, aside from Nikola Tesla, really just talking about <laughs> that, that, you know, really knowing about it, but you know, what was once seen as fringe is now like, how lucky are we in this, in our lifetime right now, starting to see that people are really grasping and accepting the importance of that frequency and vibration. And, you know, would you, if you, I don't want to put you on the spot, but I, I read somewhere that you experienced some life-changing things. Um, you survived, uh, I believe it was colon cancer. Yeah. Yeah. Wow. So hats off. Yeah. Thanks, man. Um, yeah. The, 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 yeah. So 2011, 2012, um, just became ill and ultimately got diagnosed with MS and colon cancer. Um, and I was having a lot of, um, mus I was losing control of like my muscles, having these, you know, spasms at random times. And I was having skin rashes, eating different foods I had ate my whole life, like strawberries, peanuts. And I mean, even just like lemons and like basic things I had had my whole life and just were re really struggling with di on a digestion level. Um, and having all kinds of uh, skin rashes and, you know, um, chronic migraine, headaches, dancing lights and vision, heart palpitations, anxiety attacks, like just tons of stuff that was going on on top of a lot of uh, cramping and digestion issues that were just um, uh, totally um, debilitating, you know, with all of those things going on at the same time. And um, there was lots of points where I had kind of lost hope. Like I remember thinking like, if this is what the rest of my life is going to be, I'm, I'm, I'm ready to not be here anymore. You know, it was a, it was a uh, very painful, especially the gut issues. There was, just, it, I went at one point 12 days without eating food because it was more painful to digest food than it was to be hungry. <laughs> and so it was very, um, it was a process and I, I had never to that point experienced any kind of health issue to that degree. And I also had never really been sick, um, in my life to that point, um, you, you know, dealing with something on that level. And so it, I think when you're facing that unknown and you feel hopeless, it's, it, the mindset comes down in vibration and you're, rolling in the mud with the already painful things that you're dealing with on a physical level. So when the mind and body get synced up like that, it's really hard, challenging, you know, we'll say that it's really challenging to, to move to that next level. And I think that what 
was offered to me was books that made a big difference. You know, Louise Hay, You Can Heal Your Life was a big yeah, one. Yeah, right on. Um, yeah, and another one was The Healing Power of Sound by Dr. Mitchell Gaynor. Oh, rest yeah. in peace. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Yeah, man. Yeah, and um, those books really got me started in a big way. I was already a musician, um, and so I really started getting into binaural beats and getting into um, pure tones and getting into frequency music and there wasn't a lot of music out there that was in the frequencies like there was like some electronic songs and mostly meditation stuff but I really started creating like folk music pop music electronic music uh, shamanic drumming and curtain and just a lot of music over the last six years moving into creating frequency what we dubbed as frequency minded music um you know and just really creating the foundation where the frequency was the focus and that the songs were tuned and built around that frequency whether it was the note or the key based off of what the intention was that we we're focusing on and so really changing the tuning to 432 and 444 and getting into a lot of um work with you know, what we, what I would call the LTS method today, um, which was basically binar low amplitude, subtle binaural beats as a carrier frequency, mm -hmm. and then a pure tone as a, you know, kind of like the lead singer in the band that's delivered in a more powerful method, creating like a tritone, uh, not in a musical term, but just the, <laughs> the three, you know, the, the three, the three um, notes, uh, octaves there, um, you know, harmonic healings, and just really helping the brain to step down and its brainwave state and then helping the heart rate to lower and creating a sense of foundation of calm that you're then able to start building these moving forwards and movement of stagnant energy out of the body. And that's really what started happening with me. And so it took about a year. Also, you know, I was about 315 pounds at this time. And wow. so now I'm about 170, 175 in that range, you know, and, right uh, yeah. And so it's, it was a massive change. It was a massive change for my mind and it was a massive change for my body that took place over the next three years. And, um, I would not have been able to do it without the music. The music was the thing that actually started shifting the mindset. And a lot of people will ask me like, what's the first thing for moving into healing like that? And it's mindset, like 100%. And the music was the tool that helped me get there, you know? Dude, I love that. Uh, being a musician, I can align with that on so many levels. You know, music's always just been there for me, you know, whether it's playing music or listening to music, you know, and I'm, I'm grateful for my mom for really introducing music into my life because it's, it truly has saved my life. Um, so dude, that's awesome. I, I love that. <laughs> uh, and, and you really just taking that time, you know, like in talking about like, you know, Dr. Mitchell Gaynor, like again, rest in peace. Like for me, like, you know, it, it was, you know, reading some of his material and, and at such a young age was, again, it was fringe. It was pseudoscience at that point, you know, was that yeah. like late in late nineties, I want to say when it, when it came out. So yeah. um, I'm 42. So, you know, when I was first kind of getting into that, it was just like unheard of. It wasn't really this thing that it is now where we realize we're chanting and, you know, chanting and meditation how it all works and how mind body and spirit are connected so the fact that you were able to take these components and use it to help yourself but then also now that you're helping others i think is just wonderful and profound so hats off to you thanks thanks man yeah yeah totally i think i'll just say this real quick uh music like when the context of uh movies like when you think of like a blockbuster you know, movie. And then if you took the music soundtrack out of that, it would be so funny to watch because it would be so drastically different. And I don't think that the average person that's attending the movies realizes because it's such a background piece, right. but it's also such a foreground piece when you have that knowledge of how powerful it is, you know, truly. And I think that the other side of that coin is in our self-care music can be just as amplifying, you know, to that process of motivation and inspiration 
just like in the movie where it gives you the epicness and the mm-hmm. excitement points in the movie, how much that music adds for those parts, it can do the same thing and in the inspiration and, and amplification of um, hope and positivity, you know, in your healing journey. So I think that's something that we try really hard is that listening to smile is trying to line itself with being the soundtrack for self-care, you know, in all forms, whether that's yoga and movement, riding your bike and hiking, or whether that is, you know, on the mat or a sound healing or a meditation before bed, we're trying to create music that is frequency minded and in all of those, those areas, you know. I love that because as an individual too, I can align and, and say that like, you know, I've had these conversations with folks about like, you know, whether it's advertisements, you know, marketing, you know, giants utilize frequency and vibration and they've been doing it for a long time. You know, they take symbolism and they take frequency and they use it because they know the effects it has on the human psyche. And so we're seeing this shift of consciousness where we're using frequency, vibration, and maybe symbolism to help people to, to maybe wake up to a different kind of reality, a new world of metaphysics, right? Yeah. And, and, and uh, are you familiar with the show, The Voice at all? Yeah, yeah. So I, I was having this conversation literally just the other night and someone was talking about The Voice and I said, isn't it funny where, you know, we, ha- we hear the stories from the, the, the individuals that, you know, what they've gone through and what they've been through. But if that music wasn't underneath their story, we wouldn't connect with it and feel that emotive connection to what they're saying without that music. So it's, you know, if it can do that and it can elicit emotions, why can't it heal us? It's very true. Cause think about the component that emotions actually play in our healing. You know, it's a, it's such a power. So I think the big movement right now in that's starting to come more into the mainstream from movies like the secret, right. Is everyone talking about how manifestation is really a mindset, but then the secret kind of didn't, in my opinion, touch on as much of how much the thoughts are a thing but the thoughts mixed with the emotions and the feelings of actually having the thing are really what kind of puts it over the top. So I always say frequency is the fuel, right? So it's like that and that frequency of the emotional state is really what's going to take that thought and power it to the other side of creating that goal, you know, achieving that goal. Um, And so it is one thing to shift the mind and having a more positive thought, but then to have the emotional state that matches that those two combine, you know, uh, is such a powerful thing. You'll hear people like uh, Jonathan Goldman talk about sound plus intention equals Mm. healing, right? And that's such a profound statement because it's, you know, you can do a sound bath, but if you're not in alignment with what you're trying to achieve and holding that focus and that intention, then what is the frequency doing, you know, cause this is, you're, you're essentially taking the hardware of this frequency and then you're taking your thoughts, which is the software, right? The intention and placing those together and then achieving this goal. So I think it's just, it's really powerful to help people realize how powerful those emotional states are and that there is a war on for your emotional state, right? <laughs> so, ah. Yeah. So I love you even more now, Ian. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So it, you know, poverty and oppression is meant to program you, you know, it's meant to hold you in a lower vibrational state so that you cannot achieve those dreams and all dreams are achievable. Even in the state, like if you grew up in the projects or grew up in a hard financial situation or poverty or oppression, I mean, it's, um, it's literally unfathomable how powerful those states of thought combined with those feelings can change your life so drastically and put you in alignment on a completely different grid. And that the powers that be that are in charge right now have manufactured this um, reality that is in a constant battle over your emotional state, staying in that hopeless uh, powerless, um, low vibrational state. And it's, you know, things that are happening in the world right now are a perfect example 
of how they're achieving this, you know? And so it's, uh, it's really interesting, man. It's the time that we live in, um, this next year in 2022 is going to be really interesting to watch everything unfold, you know? 100%. Oh my gosh. So well articulated. Oh my gosh. It's, it's fascinating because when you really think about that war on our consciousness and, you know, you start bringing in like, even like somatics, you know, you can start thinking about that and what these even just down to color, color vibration, you know, like I had a conversation one time with someone like, isn't it any wonder that, you know, McDonald's uses red and yellow, right? And we think about, if we think about chakras, where that aligns with closer down towards the root, right? Comes up yeah. maybe to the solar plexus, but we're not evolving, right? It's just, there's an appeal to it. Um, I don't know. It, it could be, you know, I'm not trying to be you know, that, that crazy guy, you know, but <laughs> I, I think that's what ends up happening is when you start talking about frequency and vibration, right. Even the, in the past, you know, I mean, we saw with, you know, Dr. Gaynor, like it was fringe, it was pseudoscience. And now people are starting to catch up to it. Why do you think people are more open to it now in your opinion, Ian? Yeah, I think it's been a slow evolution, but uh, I mean, I'd love to see it happening quicker, but I'm just thankful that there is movement, right? And um, I think that in my opinion, what, it, what I would say is the documentary and the internet. I think those two things, really the, the birth of the small independent films of documentaries, because they didn't have to fight for getting into Warner Brothers and, you know, because they, they, those movies never would have happened, you know, so you have these lower budget films that have more freedom that they started, you know, kind of edging their way into the mainstream. And you had movies back in the day, like what the bleep do we know? Like that whole, yeah. that whole thing. And it had such a huge success that it opened the door for a lot of these other films to start coming through. And because of that, I think film is such a powerful thing, man. It's like you're combining uh, literature, you're combining poetry and, and these things with music and visuals, right? The, and it's such a powerful learning tool for most people in the world. Um, and it's also just such a direct connection with the the viewer and listener of these films and so um when those films started reaching the mainstream and getting more notoriety and more publicity um it was super powerful but then the internet you know like youtube i, we, I was just having a conversation today with a guy that you know he was saying you can learn anything on youtube these days like it's just it's out there there's so much information and i think people are starting to really stand in their truth and speak mm. authentically. Um, and people are becoming less fearful of being the crazy person. I think they're just like, I'm crazy, man. Let's go for a ride, you know? And so I think, I think yeah, I think, I think that's what, in my opinion, I think those two things really had a huge uh door opening effect. And then you have these people now in social and activist roles that are really challenging, suing Monsanto and winning and creating these battles that are showing people like, we can do this, like we can stand to these powers and win, but we need more of you to start stepping out with us and to, you know, being more in unity with like um, the vision that we're holding for the planet, which is not allowing the lesser, um, the lower vibrational parts of capitalism <laughs> and well as well as just you know greed and um and just the darker side of life you know it's out there but there are there are also these other loving powerful amazing things in life and i think those are being brought to the forefront more with these films and and artists you know the one thing that i would really like to see i'll say this in closing is there's not a lot of bands that are speaking out anymore. And I would love to see more bands finding their voice, their authenticity of speaking out because art, uh, you know, life really imitates art. And if art can lead the way by example of showing what it could look like and what it could be to be in unity and to stand together and also to challenge the things that are going wrong that we know are wrong and a lot of people aren't speaking on, you know, and I think that art is a powerful delivery system for 
those grievances, you know? Um, so <laughs> yeah, I, I couldn't have said it any better. So, so some of you, I mean, being a musician, you, you started, you know, playing music for, you know, different reasons than where you're at now, which I consider like sonic shamanism at this point for you. <laughs> but um, when you started playing in like bands and things like that, like, like what genres, what bands are like your big influences, if you don't mind sharing? Yeah, no. So the first band I played in was a punk rock band. I think I was um, 16, 15 or 16. I can't remember. I think I was 16. I could barely play the guitar, uh, but it was fun. And I was really into like the Descendants and Germs and like a nice. bunch of, you know, bands like that. Um, and then I grew into like metal and I got into uh, playing in some metal bands. And I did, I was really into like the Deftones and nice. you know, all that stuff back then, you know, good stuff. And, uh, and then it, and then one day I remember, uh, a cover band showed up to one of the metal shows and they said, Hey Ian, we want you to come play in our cover band. And I remember that all the guys I was playing with in the metal band were like, nah, you can't go play with them, you know, but, <laughs> so, but I saw, I saw how much money those guys were making in their cover band. And they were like, they had nice equipment, you know, I had all this, you know, junk equipment. And so it was, uh, it was, that was, a uh appealing thing for me back then and so i i made the transition i started learning and the other thing that really sealed the deal for me to make that switch was they were better than me as musicians they were very talented could play anything they wanted wow. so it was a stretch for me to join their band and i i love to be challenged you know like to to learn new things um and so that was a big transition and from there the cover band led into playing with like classical ensembles getting into folk and world music and kind of fusion and then i got into like new age and then i got into trip-hop and hip-hop started yeah. making beats and yeah so i just i just love music like all all forms and i think that it's been really a journey for me just coming and i think it's why now when you look at listening to smile we have 150 albums in our discography that we've created in just six years, which is like wow. insane. And uh, it's just been a, a huge humbling process and like challenging process. Every month we make a new album, you know, and it's in the astrology and the current events. And so it's like you're talking six to seven songs, mixing, mastering, writing and recording every month. Um, and then uh, all the genres, you know, like we have, all those different genres we discussed earlier. So it's just, I think it's been really fun and liberating as a musician because I have, I don't have to stick to a style. Like mm -hmm. I always talk about Coldplay. Coldplay is like tried and true. They create these songs and they're poppy. You can like them or not like them, but they've done something with that. And in the beginning you make something and you say, well, if you like it, great. Right. But as you build this huge, massive world international following, then it's like there's this pressure to create the same stuff over and over. And then if you do it, everyone says, oh, they've lost their touch, right? And I remember seeing in the Basquiat film uh, where they were talking about this, where it's like you keep doing the same thing, you've lost it. If you do something new and outside of the box, everyone's like, yeah, you've lost it. You're not, you're not in the zone, right? And so it's just constantly judge and judgment and ridicule, right? But I think that as an artist, you have to do what speaks to you. And then, and then everything else will fall into place. You will find your audience. And I think that I have lost the fear and I can truly say that like in authenticity that I do what I want to do. And I'm really, really blessed that I have a platform where I can do pretty much any music that I want to do and it will be accepted because it's such a wide variety that we're encompassing in so many different styles and functionality with the music and it's just really a, a great place to be. It's really a lot of fun to do. I love that because how many musicians can really say that when they're actually, they've got a platform and, or maybe they even have a fan base, they have an audience and you can literally do any genre you want because it's, it's rooted in literally helping people and being beneficial. And I, I think that's just wonderful. Thanks man. Yeah. It's a lot of fun. Dude, that's <laughs> huge. Yeah. Um, I love what you said about, you know, wanting and I'm paraphrasing here, but wanting artists to really use their platform more or maybe speaking out, right? Because art is really, you know, music and art, poetry, all, all those that are under the umbrella of creativity and art. Like, I feel like musicians as a whole usually are 
a bit more, you know, out of step, right? We're a little bit more left or right of center, and maybe we've been ostracized or alienated, bullied even. Um, you know, I know, I know, I was, you know, I, um, not quite as proficient as you were. Uh, I lost eighty pounds um, okay. years ago, and and yeah. but I was a bigger guy, and it was a life changing thing for me personally, and I know what that did for me. Um, spiritually as well as just like for my esteem because I had almost just kind of given up so as an artist and when I started playing more music I felt compelled but carried that like wanting to love and help people because I had been ostracized or alienated at some points in time do you feel like in your opinion obviously do you feel like those of us who have been alienated or maybe ostracized that maybe we have a little bit more of an, not advantage out of a lack of better terms, but like maybe we're more inclined to wanting to speak our truth or to help people. Yeah. I think for me, I think what I would say is that you bring a unique perspective and, and a new new way of framing uh, a viewpoint, I guess, you know? Um, So like, this happens a lot in the veteran community. You talk about these guys that have gone to see things that we could never imagine on the battlefields, you know, and then they have a perspective and a viewpoint that we have can, cannot even understand, you know? Um, and so they bring a wisdom when they, when they come back and heal this PTSD and these traumas that they have and they work on themselves when they start interacting with the community, I I mean, in any state, but especially when they've evolved and ascended these things that have been weighing on them heavy, there are these levels that they bring to the community just in their interaction with people uh, that really changes those communities, you know? And, And I think that all of us have that unique story, you know, like if all, if every person that had been through something, right? Like I'm, you've given me this opportunity to be a part of this podcast with you and to reach your viewership and and my viewership by saying, hey, here's a new podcast, people check it out. They get some experiences and, and inspirations and it, you know, helps people, right? But I think like you have shows like the Kardashians and you have all these different, you know, shows that, that highlight these, these, celebrities right and i think that a lot of the i mean obviously this could be a judgment on my part or whatever but it's a lot of the things that are in these shows are kind of lower vibrational things right but imagine if you if we started having shows like the voice that showcased the triumph of coming from like you losing your weight or someone fighting cancer or someone coming from the other side of PTSD and, and changing their life around and, and actually having shows that highlighted the average basic person, how many people could relate to this person's just like me. They did this, they accomplished this thing. And now that gives me inspiration to do that, you know? And I think that it's just, it's just really, really neat to see the power of the human heart. I mean, that's like what we're really talking about is the transformation and then the, the heart, the light in the heart that wants to share this experience. Like, Hey, I, I suffered and went through this, but I don't want you to have to do that. You know, if I can give you some information and some, some tools that might help you so that you don't have to go through the same thing. And I think a lot of us do that with our kids or our families you know, we want to do that same sharing. And I think the world is opening up because of those documentaries and all the things that are allowing this shift, you know, that's taking place. And um, I think it's just really crucial that we stay focused on the positive aspects of the shift, because the powers that be are trying to make you focus on the negative side of the shift and to gain, to use it as a manipulation and a form of control. But um, honestly, I think the power of the mind and the power of our you know, the perspective that we're holding is really dictating where we're going, you know, as a whole, as a, as, as a unity consciousness type of approach. Yeah. 100%. Uh, And what would you suggest for, for individuals to maybe, you know, when we talk about the powers that be trying to hold us in a a lower vibrational state, 
what would you mm -hmm. recommend individuals maybe who aren't open right now? Like, how do we combat some of that? And uh, combat's the wrong word. I don't want to use something that's a negative for a negative, but how yeah. do we overcome that, right? Mm -hmm. Well, so I think the, I'll, t I'll share a story. I'll open up a little bit here. So recently, um, our business has been growing a lot and it's been really great being on Paul Check's podcast. He really put us on the map with a lot of different people. And um, it's been really, really fun uh, just watching all these new people come in from, from that podcast. And it was awesome. And um, in doing that, there was like this um, challenge for, for us as, as, you know, you go through growing pains in a business and you, you move and level up and, and all of that. And, um, so manifesting became a focus this last six months, eight, eight months for me. And one of the things I was reading was Yogananda and Yogananda, um, a lot of the books, several of the books, um, you know, like, um, scientific affirmations, uh, there's one, uh, living fearlessly. And there was another one called the spiritual success or, uh, laws, laws of success, you know, uh, book that he had. And, um, it, it was just really interesting because I found it challenging when I would read some of his affirmations, like one of them was I am rich. And so when I would come across that, I would read it. And then I'd kind of like, <laughs> Hmm, and, you know, and then I would start thinking like, why does this feel so challenging for me to say this out loud? And like, um, you know, there, there's that part in the mind, like where I had been homeless before um, I went through, uh, when I got sick, I lost everything. I lost my car, the house, I lost uh, everything, you know, that I had and um, a lot of my music instruments and, and just everything. So when you go through an experience like that, there's always this fear, no matter how far you crawl out of that hole, that you're going to go back, you know, and I've heard a lot of people talk about this, whether it's cancer, whether it's being homeless, you have this fear that it's going to come back and that you're going to ultimately be there. And um, when those types of things come up, I think it's really interesting to sit in that shadow work of facing that bear, that beast, you know, that rears its head. And I think that that is the most profound work that we can do is to be uncomfortable. I think that the, the new age community, the spiritual community wants to sell you this dream of being happy and peaceful and being, uh, and, and I think ultimately we want that, you know, we want to do the work and to achieve that guru status of being able to, no matter what comes in the face you know, uh, comes across our day that we're able to deal with that in a calm, peaceful, reserved manner because being angry and being upset and doing those things are all human. But ultimately, the stress and, and tax that it puts on the body is not what we really want. So I think ideally, we would like to be that guru type status and be able to handle things that way. But when you're getting started, we're just not there. And so I think that the, the true work that we, I mean, in my opinion, the true work that we're doing in these moments is facing those demons, facing those traumas, those, those, those monsters in the dark that come. And for me, it was feeling not worthy of being rich. Right. And so I started really, uh, recently I started a new, uh, workout routine, super inspired by Paul check. Right. <laughs> and so, so as I'm working out, uh, you know, dumbbells, kettlebell, uh, push up setups, jumping jacks, all the, all the stuff, you know, um, I started saying I am rich and I started realizing like how powerful muscle memory is as you're working out and you're doing these breaking down of the muscle, building the muscle and, you know, in those workout routines, just kept saying those mantras, I am rich, I'm divinely protected, I'm healing. And just saying these over and over as I'm working out the entire time. And within two months, I started seeing changes in my mental, you know, uh, challenge with these, with these affirmations. But then I started seeing even more powerful results in my external environment, bringing in these new opportunities, new manifestations of resources and, and connections. And so it was just so, such a powerful, like personal test 
to be uncomfortable and to face it to where I just beat my subconscious into submission. Like we're doing this, man, no matter how you feel about it, this is what's happening, you know? And, uh, and so I think that it, to me is where you start is being uncomfortable. And it's like the Rocky, the parts in Rocky, the, the video montage when he's working out and playing the music to get pumped and running in the streets, you know, it's like, that is what we have to do. I think in our personal lives to truly break through to the other side, like Jim Morrison said, right? So, so it's like, you know, it's just, um, I think it's just, it's very tedious and slow in the beginning. And I think that it takes a commitment to really see it through. But I think in the end, when you look back at that time, it's going to seem like it wasn't that hard. It's just the consistency that you need to do it in is, is challenging in the beginning, you know? 100%, you know, that mind state, you know, that PMA, that positive mental attitude and shifting that and rewiring our brains, you know, for a long period of time, I didn't have much self-esteem and I was in a really bad relationship for, you know, X amount of time and was married and it was a toxic situation for me. And it took some, it took some, you know, digging and some counseling and some therapy for me to really find my, my self-worth again and to, to feel mm -hmm. like I needed to do these affirmations daily. So I am right on board with you on saying that. That's just awesome. Power of the mind, man. <laughs> um, dude, uh, I, another thing too, is like with frequencies and, and, and like how, I, I know you talked a little bit about some of the books that you got into, uh, you know, but what was the catalyst for you saying like, no, 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 I'm, I'm, this is it. I've got to, I've got to pursue this. I've got to go down this Avenue. Yeah. So within the first two weeks of starting things on YouTube, just doing some of the frequency stuff that I could find on YouTube back then, this was like 2009, 2010, you like around that when I was um, starting to dabble in this. And then really 2011 is when it like, you know, fully launched. So I already had the musical side of things like kind of under my belt, but really diving into moving out of entertainment base to more holistic healing approach um, was really that year, 2011 and 2012. And, and th that those two years were like huge, but the first two weeks of working with binaural beats, I remember I was, um, T having conversation with my mom, my mom. And I said, um, I don't think I've ever known what peace is my whole life, you know, to that point. Like I, I was an artist. So I'm, I, I write poetry. I'm a painter, visual artist, and I also uh, play music, right? So anything creative, I do some graphic design, some video editing and things of that nature, but my brain is just super creative. I love anything that uh, gives me that opportunity to make something from nothing, right? That's just mm -hmm. such fun for me. So my brain never stopped. It was like laying in bed, just, you know, just <laughs> constantly thinking about what I wanted to make, you know, what I wanted to create. And I remember when I first got my first real studio, like home recording studio, like now we probably, I mean, it's not huge. I mean, we probably have like probably 30 grand of gear, you know, like um, just, you know, 30, 35 grand a gear. And we make you know, great use of that. And it's something that has taken time to build, but it's like the, the, the studio, once I had that first set up, I remember I'm never leaving this, this place. Like I, I will stay here <laughs> day and night and people are like, how do you do that? And I'm like, I travel like somewhere else, you know, like it's a, it's a huge thing. And it was such a therapy for me, you know, to like get all this stuff out. So the first evolution was listening and seeing the profound effect that binaural beats had on me. Mm -hmm. But when I saw that it was like starting to fix my dyslexia, I was having a lot of issues most of my life retaining information, like reading a page, I have to read it five, six, seven times to like take it in. And so I started seeing, I was browsing stuff and just like holding it. And I was, there was like, my family was saying, you know, I grew up with a speech impediment younger and I was in learning disability classes from third grade through sixth grade. So my sisters and mom were like, you know, you're talking faster. You seem smarter. You're talking about like 
physics and quantum physics and yeah. you know all these different things and they're just like you're blowing my mind what what's and i was like it's the frequencies man you know it's like it's like, it's like you know it's just like such a far out thing um and so it was just so weird but once i started seeing those changes i was just like all in i was like i'm this is what i want to do I, I knew it was what i wanted to do with the rest of my life um sharing this with people making this music and just being in those creative environments and so there was just really no looking back at that point you know that's awesome and uh clearly a supportive family of this venture yeah yeah my so my dad was a musician and um my the rest of my family is very different the, i'm kind of like the black sheep but they uh are very supportive of what i'm doing you know they think um it's really awesome i think um i remember uh being on paul check's podcast that was one of the first podcasts that my mom actually got to see the whole thing all the way through um and so um you know it was just such a big deal because I think they finally saw like they knew what I was doing and were supporting of supporting of that but when they saw that the Paul Check podcast they just like really um they put it all together I think like clicked like oh man this is helping people all over the world and so it's it's definitely just really humbling and exciting to be a part of that and for them to to see like you know all those all those years of uh struggling musician yeah. uh, now being able to <laughs> to apply it in a different way. I think it was really exciting for them to, to see that, you know? Yeah. That must be so validating as well too. Yeah. Yeah. It's, um, it's definitely a, a good feeling. Um, I watched uh, Moneyball last night, you know, with Brad Pitt. I don't know if you've seen that movie. I don't think I've seen that movie. No. Yeah. So it, it's a Moneyball. baseball movie. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. It's a baseball movie and it's got, you know, this will destroy you is the, is the soundtrack to the, to, I don't know if you're familiar with that band. They're super amazing, but uh, I've heard the name. I'm, I'm not familiar with their music. Full disclosure. Yeah. You should check it out. It's instrumental. It's like uh, oh. explosions in the sky. Kind oh, of okay. Yeah, All right. Super, super cool band, but their, their, their music's in that. And um, it's just really neat because there's a part in the movie where they're running baseball in a completely different way. It's all statistic based. And so all the traditional people are just slamming them, slamming them. And when they start finally pulling it through, like they go to the, you know, the uh, playoffs and um, just, you know, they had the, the largest winning streak in baseball history. Uh, and so when that happened, you could just see like, uh, it's like, hey, this is working, you know, and it's like, it was such a just like, they were so justified and like, all the stuff that they did that nobody understood before, right. And I think that it's just neat to get to that point where you say like, all this struggle, all these obstacles, all these things that I went through was for something. And now it's being applied and, and, and even validated, you know, in your mind, that, you know, this was worth what I endured to to get here you know so i think it's neat it's a neat part of, to be there like in that process i love that so if you had to recommend to anybody some reading recommendations what would those be oh man there's so many let's see um <laughs> where to begin <laughs> yeah yeah the, i think one of the um there's so many i say i'm trying to think of uh yeah, definitely the Louise Hay book is, is such a great place to start for just mindset and recalibration. Yeah. The pioneer, power in, pioneer in new thought, man. Yes, definitely. Big and time. if they, yeah, and it's, it's a pretty famous book, but the, um, uh, the healing power of sound by Mitchell Gaynor is great. Yes. And there's also here, let me get you this real quick. Yeah, absolutely. So this book here, the Healing Forces of Harmonic Sounds and Vibrations. Ooh. This is a great book, especially for beginners. I think it has everything in there that uh, you could want to understand or know. Um, it's just broke down in very kind of layman's terms, and it really helps, um, I think, get a broad view of, like, all that's out there. Right on. And this, this book... Power Sound, Joshua yeah. Leeds. Oh. Yeah, and this is a great book. There's lots of information in here, and I think it's a great read. Um, 
uh, very cool stuff. And, and the other thing besides these was, I would say the book of five to eight by Dr. Lynn Horowitz. Nice. Um, that's a really powerful book too. So those are all just really great books to get to dive into and to get started in the book of five to eight deals a little bit more with conspiracy around okay. traditional tuned music, like four forty. <laughs> yeah. 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 And, uh, so it's a really interesting read if people are interested in that, but yeah, wow. I mean, dude, that's awesome. Wow. I love it. Great, great, great finds and great books. Um, (laughs) And what would be some of your listening recommendations? Like, I mean, all spectrums, my friend, and no pun intended. (laughs) Yeah, yeah. Um, Man, they're so one of my favorite bands of all time is Sigur Ross, Sigur Ross. Um, You know, I really, I really love them a lot and I highly suggest them. Um, There's a lot of people that I'm coming across recently that um are having a lot of issues releasing trauma right and and uh, and experiencing emotional there's a lot of people that i know that um hold in tears and and grieving right and and it's such a powerful emotion to release and let go and so a lot of people ask me what kind of music um i would suggest that is like um, in that realm. And, and for me, like, I think Sigur Ross is such an emotional band, like the, what they do and Bon Iver, uh, is, you know, some of yes. his albums are very amazing. And the other thing is there's this artist that I really love right now. His name is Clem Leak, like, and the name of the album is called Rest. It's a guitar album. It's all instrumental guitar music and it's very emotional and people can listen to it and they'll just cry. And it's oh. like, it, it has such a, a profound effect. And, and, um, you know, we create music that, um, you know, we have an album that is, um, minimalist piano that we just created instrumental piano music. And we try to create songs that will touch you in your heart and create that open hearted release Um, as well as things that will make you happy and uplift you. And I think that when you really, it's like, you know how food combinations are so critical, like combining different foods really have an effect on the body. I believe that music is the same way. So I think Mm -hmm. people say, well, I can't listen to this music. It makes me too sad. And I said, but listen to something after it helps you with the release, listening to Bob Marley afterwards, you know what I'm saying? Like put on something that lifts your spirits and helps you because the, the first part of that is the medicine, the release of the, mm-hmm. those tears and that, that, that emotional stagnant energy that you need to move. Crying is the easiest way. Like, you know, you know what I'm saying? It literally is. And to let yourself experience that music and that feeling then change it now with listening to something happy. You know, there's a band that's more recent that I'm just so impressed with. Um, it's not my style of music, but I love their albums. You know what I'm saying? And I love the musicianship and what they're doing. They're called Surfaces. I don't know if you know Ooh, them. Surfaces. They had, a, yeah, they had a, a song called Sunday's Best or something like that. And it's super, it's, it's like, if you combine like Bob Marley with like Jack Johnston, it's like this, these, Ooh. these, <laughs> these, yeah, these songs are just super upbeat. They got some soul and some jazzy parts in there. So it's a lot of fusion stuff, but it reminds me of old seventies music with like a modern twist, you know? Okay. And it's, um, it's, uh, and so I suggest these things to people all the time. And I, I listen to so much stuff. Like a lot of people will say the mixes I make people are like chronic schizophrenia or something. <laughs> it's like, you know, it's like, it's just all over the place. Yeah. I, and, and I just, for me personally, I just love so much music. And one of my favorite musicians is, is uh, Zappa. I just, yeah. I love, yeah, I love, I love Zappa. And I just think the musicianship and what he did with making, uh, the listener work for what was coming next. And I think that's a great thing, you know? Heck so, yeah. Yeah. Dude, great selections. Oh my gosh. <laughs> gosh. I, I feel a kindredness here. I understand on so many yeah. levels. I, I, Oh my gosh. Yeah. Zappa oh, all day. <laughs> Dude. And, and, and it's crazy that we like, you know, I, I've always been challenged with someone, you know, playing, you know, metal bands in, uh, and then to have this, I don't know, just to, I'll just come out and say it, to be a male in the metal world, you're, 
you know, everyone expects a certain kind of action and emotion from you or a certain how you carry yourself, you know, whereas I'm a more emotive individual and I, I tend to listen to stuff outside of that. Well, I love metal and I play metal. I, I don't always listen to metal. You know, it's, it's, I listen yeah. to things that are far more emotive and because there are times I just need a good cry. I just need to mm-hmm. get some of that out and just release and then move on. And it's, it's been one of the best things for me. So I'm, I'm so glad to hear someone else, you know, say that. And thank you for sharing that. Yeah. Yeah, man. No problem. I think it's really tough, man. Um, I was having a conversation uh, with a female recently about toxic masculinity and mm-hmm. she was speaking on how a lot of the toxic masculinity was showing up in her life. And I said, but do you understand what, I mean, to, to really get down to what men are expected? I said, no matter what, obviously this is my opinion, but no matter 100%. what people say, uh, men are, are held to this, this bar of being Superman all the time of not crying, being strong. Don't, 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 uh, be afraid, be strong and confident and know exactly what you want when you want it and do all these things that are in alignment with that masculine energy. But there is so much more, uh, you know, in the expression of human life, uh, than one, one mode. And I think that there is no talk around mental health for, you know, for the, the average man and, and the toll that it takes on, you know, you get shot in the leg, rub some dirt on it. You're going to be fine. You know, it's like, it's, uh, you know, shake it off. Oh, don't, don't cry. Boys don't cry. Be tough, be Mm. tough, shake it off. And it's just like, you're constantly made to feel like it's, um, an abnormal thing to have emotions and to express those emotions is a weakness. But what's really interesting is from my time being in metal bands, when you're on the stage, it's so easy to be in rage and to play heavy and to play loud. And like, that's so fun. Right. But now if I took that song and stripped it down to an acoustic guitar and just put you on the stage by yourself to share that in front of thousands of people, you're going to be shaking right? Because that takes more strength to be that vulnerable than it does to be in rage and rocking out on the stage in front of all those people, right? Um, And so I think that the perspective needs to shift on what strength is, right, for the, the average man. And I think strength is being vulnerable and being expressive in your emotions. And obviously, there is a balance, right, to be in the healthy masculine energy, there, there are parts of you that need to relate to the divine uh, feminine, right? And you need to be nurturing and loving and understanding and compassionate. But there's also about being in your strength of being confident and being strong and being a protector, right? And so I think that it's just really skewed, like people's view of what healthy masculine energy is. And what is it's it's not just the person like our environment has a play in this our parental you know years you know being under that guidance has a play in this and obviously as you get older you're responsible for this healing but there's also these partnerships whether that's your wife or you know even your family members that play a part in the support network you know it's it's a, a family unit uh, is a powerful thing, you know, navigating life. And um, we all are responsible for each other in that way, you know, and I think even down to the communities, uh, you know, that we put our time and investments in, you know, and so I think like, we're going to get there. I think that this whole COVID thing has been an awakening and a magnifying glass on mental health, as well as just the services around the world, uh, Mm -hmm. tax and government and finances. And (laughs) people are seeing all of the ugly beasts, man. And so I think it's, yeah, it's, it's here, man. The the shift is here. It's just up to us to continue carrying that torch to the next, the next level, you know? I couldn't agree more. And I think that is a wonderful place for a crescendo, my friend. That was okay. well put. Yeah. I don't think we can go anywhere better than that. So <laughs> hats off, yeah. sir. 
Ian, this has been, I, I thank you so much from my heart. I, I can't thank you enough. Um, I truly hope to stay in touch and um, continue some dialogue at a future time as well too, man. I'm just vastly excited about what you're doing. Um, and if you can uh, give us some information about listening to smile, if you want, throw some plugs yeah. in my friend. Yeah, man. So listening to smile.com is the website. And uh, my email is Ian at listening to smile.com. If you want to contact me. Um, and basically we have the affiliate program that people can work with. And we also have music um, on Bandcamp, So you can go to uh, listening to smile, the number one, listening to smile number one dot bandcamp dot com and you can find our wellness series and there's uh, everything there from pain management and anxiety but you know even down to movement meditation music so um yeah there's a lot there to go through but um yeah that's that's what i would say is the contact points and spotify we're on spotify if you look up listening to smile there's some there's three albums on spotify that you can sample heck yeah man that is awesome uh, and anything uh, coming up soon that uh, you want to let some people know about? Well, we uh, are working on a few projects, but the biggest thing that I'm really excited about right now is we have a certification program coming out for coaches. Uh, that's like um, hypnotherapist, life coaches and counselors that's teaching how to work with frequency music and to basically um, suggest the right soundtrack and creating a soundtrack for the clients based on the focus and targets that they're working on. And then also teaching them how to record their voice and mix their voice and creating custom tracks for each of their clients with the music involved in it. So this is called personal frequency coaching certification. And, uh, and we're going to be hopefully opening that up in February. And if everything uh, timing wise lines up, it looks like it might be through the Czech Institute that we're going to be uh, releasing that. So that's, that's a really exciting. So that's awesome. Yeah. Kudos. Awesome. Thanks, man. Yeah. Well, thank you. Ian, thank you so very much. I, I hope you have a wonderful holiday season. If you celebrate holidays uh, that are coming up, uh, I just really I can't thank you enough for all the wonderful stuff that you're putting out into the world and just the, the love that you clearly have in your soul. So thank you for sharing your spirit with us today. Thanks, man. Thank you for having me. And there it is. I thoroughly enjoyed my conversation with Ian Morris. I cannot say enough wonderful stuff about what that man is doing. We talked about some really great reading recommendations uh, within the conversation. Of course, we, we talked about and what came up was uh, Louise Hayes' uh, You Can Heal Your Life, as well as Dr. Mitchell Gaynor's book, Healing Power of Sound, phenomenal books. Uh, and the reading recommendations that Ian gave to us were fantastic, and I'm gonna look into myself. One, The Healing Forces of Harmonic Sounds and Vibrations by J. Emanuel Morales. We also learned about The Power of Sound by Joshua Leeds, as well as another book that I'm really interested in, The Book of 528 by Dr. Len Horowitz. And I'm so excited we talked about Sigur Ross and we, uh, I learned about uh, Clem Leak and that album Rest that I'm definitely gonna check out, as well as that new band Surfaces you were making me aware of. So totally gonna check that out. Thank you so much, Ian. You can follow Ian on Instagram at listening to smile. And you can also check out listeningtosmile.com and really experience the mission that Ian is implementing in life. If you're watching this, be sure to hit that like button, subscribe to the channel, and hit that notification bell so you can hear about any new episodes coming out. I thoroughly enjoyed doing this, and it's a wonderful journey thus far. So thank you so much all for joining me. Until next time, take care of one another, and keep thinking for yourself.